Good morning. Happy Thursday to you. It's good to be with you this morning, and I pray that God is richly blessing your day because it is a gorgeous day. It's a little bit um, a little bit of weather out there. Uh, it's still dark, so we'll see when the sun starts to come out how, uh, how it looks, but I think there is some weather out there today. Um, I live on the railroad track, and the... In Vail, through Vail, there's two railroad tracks. There's the North Track, which is the original track from the 1880s, and then there's the, the South Track, which is an additional track that was added at some point. It has the high-speed train. So on the, on the South Track, the train goes by about 70 to 80 miles an hour. On the North Track, because it has to go through Cienega Creek Preserve, which has a lot of winding curves in it, it's limited to 25 miles an hour. But... Right now, I don't know if you noticed this, but they are redoing the South Track. They're putting in new uh, railroad ties, not the concrete ones that are like on the North Track, but it's the old creosote-soaked wooden rail railroad tracks that are on the South Railroad, and they are pulling all those out and putting in new ones. And so all the train traffic that would normally be split between the two tracks there. It's all on the track that's by my house. So we've had so many trains go by, <laughs> uh, in my, in my location, it's just train after train after train. And normally, normally on the North track, all the trains come from the West to go to the East. But right now, because they're doing this, the trains are 50% of them come from the east and 50% of them come from the west. And I don't know how they switch it out and how they're doing that, but it is absolutely amazing that they're doing that. You'll have two or three trains going in one direction, then you have two or three trains going the other direction, then two or three trains going the other direction. And they just do this back and forth all the time, all day. I think we normally get about, I would say, a train an hour. And we've been getting we've been getting probably three trains an hour because there's more traffic on the on the south track than there is on the north track. Nobody wants to be on the south on the north track. If you're a conductor or a train operator and you can go 25 miles an hour on the north track or 60 miles an hour, or 80 miles an hour on the on the south track, you'll choose the south track if it's available. So the vast majority of traffic goes on the south track. But uh, right now we get it all. And let's see what else. Uh, birthdays. I don't believe we have any birthdays today, but I will just double check to make sure that we have no birthdays today. I remember there being one tomorrow, if I remember correctly. Um, today is the 28th. Yeah, so there's one birthday tomorrow, but no birthdays today. And then there's a couple over the weekend. And let's see what else. Oh, um, I wanted to share with you a little bit about some good news. So I subscribe. I get news feeds from all the major newspapers, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, L.A. Times, just the, the ones that are that are major, major newspapers. And you can subscribe to them and they will give you news feed updates. Well, in my mailbox this morning, a couple interesting. One was on the USA. It was a USA Today article about how the coronavirus vaccine was developed and all of that sort of thing. But apparently starting about in the United States, starting about two or three or maybe even four weeks ago, we have been seeing a decline in the amount of hospitalizations in the United States. And according to the New York Times, it was a New York Times article, it is rapidly declining, rapidly, rapidly declining, the number of cases. Now, there is also two strains. There's a UK strain and there is a South African strain that are mutations of the original coronavirus, but they're looking into it. They're, they're fairly confident the vaccine will protect against that, and they're hopeful that if you've had coronavirus, that you would also be protected against this new strain of vaccine. It apparently is more virulent, but it's but does not appear to be more deadly. All that is to say, according to the New York Times this morning, we may be starting into the process of herd immunity because there have been 25,000 or 25 million uh, a, a approved, uh, 25 million cases, confirmed cases in the United States, but they think 
that it's actually about four times as high as that, which means that about 100 million people in the United States have had COVID if the numbers hold. And, and then on top of that, 25 million people have been vaccinated. And so as these vaccinations are rolling out, we are rapidly getting to the point where a large number of people have been vaccinated or have had coronavirus. Well, what does that mean? Well, they're saying when it gets to 70 or 80 percent, you're at herd immunity, which means it's you're never going to be protected against it, even if you get that, even if you get the vaccine. But it's it's basically like the flu. But it's just hard to transmit it because so many people have been vaccinated and, and so many people have had it that it's just going to go through. So that's that's exciting news. The other exciting news is that the second wave is basically on the decline. So if we can just hold out for about another, I would say, three or four or five weeks, we should be at the bottom apex of the second wave. And if you'll remember, in previous flus, it was the second wave that was the more deadly of the two waves. And after the second wave, there is a sometimes a third wave, but it's not nearly as deadly as the second wave. Well, we probably won't even have a third wave. If we can really get a number of people vaccinated, it is quite possible we may not have a third wave, which is typically six months after the second wave. So that would be putting us in June or July. And I saw Dr. Fauci say that by the end of summer or early fall, anybody who wants to be vaccinated will be vaccinated. So I just think this is all good news, my friends. I think, I think we are seeing a huge light at the end of the tunnel and I'm very, very excited and hopeful for what that's going to look like. As far as us as a church goes, we are going to continue worshiping in two small worship services. When I say small, they're not the full-blown worship. There's no singing. There's just listening type stuff in the worship. We're going to continue doing that probably for at least February or March. But then who knows after that? Who knows after that? And then we are going to launch what the new everything will look like over the summer and into the fall with some big launch stuff later in the fall. So keep your eyes posted for that. And praise God for medicine and medical science. And we, we thank him that he's walked through us through this whole thing. But I do believe that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And I'm very, very excited about that light at the end of the tunnel. But Jesus is the light that's at the end of the tunnel. He's the light in the middle of the tunnel. He's the light before you even get into the tunnel because he is the light. All right. Um, I think I was going to show you some John Hopkins stuff and some Pima County stuff, but it's already eight after. Maybe I'll do that later on in the week. I think we'll just go ahead and go into James. So we are in James chapter 5, coming near the end, and we finished off at verse 12 yesterday, where we were talking about how we should have patience in our suffering, and um, now we're going to move into kind of more of um, Proverbs out of, out of James, and I think we'll just, just go ahead and read it, and then we'll comment on it. So this is James chapter 5, beginning at verse 13. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So much good stuff here. So much good stuff here. So let's just dive right into it. Is anyone among you in trouble? If you'll remember when we first started this Bible study back 25 episodes ago, the whole book of James starts out with uh, with trials and tribulations. Blessed are you who go through trials and tribulations. That that word is perasmus in the Greek. In the Greek, perasmus it means tribulations, trials, uh, things that happen in your life that have the potential to strengthen your faith. If if God walks with you, and you see God's bigger picture in this thing, then you'll see your faith grow. That's 
That's the, the trials and tribulations in James 1. Here is anyone among you in trouble. This is a different word. It's uh, kakapatheo, which means bad. Pathos, kako is bad or evil. Patheo is, is um, feelings, emotions. Uh, pathology uh, comes from that. Uh, pathetic comes from that. Emotions. So basically, are you having bad? Are, is anyone, in, anyone among you having bad emotions, having bad feelings, having struggles? It's not the struggles of James 1 that produces perseverance. This is just, this is maybe a lighter form of struggle. Anyone among you struggling? This might even be very similar to what Luther called tentatio, where you live out your life and the struggles and the temptations and, the, and just the life itself comes into your life. And if you are rooted in God's word and you're rooted in prayer, then these things, God will help you through these things. And, and this is part of growing our faith is to have these things in our life. So if anyone among you is having d b bad, bad feelings, bad emotions, things of this nature, what do you do? Let them pray. Let them pray. This is so good advice. If any of you is going anything in your life that you're struggling with, according to James, just pray. And it took me a long time in my life before I realized the power and the importance of this. And I think it's not necessarily that I, I, I just, it, it uh, probably comes from the fact that, uh, and I've said this before, I, I like to think about things for a long time. And in my life, because I was such a wimpy kid, I would never get into arguments or never beat up. And I, mean, I did in second grade, you know, get into fights, third grade. But, but after that, I just, I felt fighting was stupid and that if I could always avoid a fight by just thinking about how I'm going to avoid the fight and avoid the fight. So I've always used that part of my brain that can, over, you know, think about things, take the long view and I can usually figure things out, which is probably why I was a great engineer. I, I enjoyed engineering. I was very good at that career. I was a very good engineer because I could always figure things out. That was my job at all the companies is if they had a problem that just couldn't be figured out, they would come to David and he would probably, it might take him a day or two to figure it out, but he could always figure it out. And I love it. I just love engineering puzzles. I love figuring out. I love chess. I mean, all these things I love. And because of that, you would think that'd be a great blessing, but it's also a great curse. And the reason why it's a great curse is because I was always relying on my own power and my own brain and my own things that God had put in my life to figure things out. I always figured if I could just figure it out, I could, I could figure it out. But when you're a pastor you realize there are things you simply cannot figure out. The human condition is just too strange. It's too, it's, there, there are no patterns. I mean, there are patterns, but there's just, the human condition is so volatile. Is that the word I want to say? It's so volatile that once you figure out one thing about the human con condition, it, it unleashes a Pandora's box about a whole other side of the human condition. There's no way you can trap it. There's no way you can control it. There's no way that you can wrap a box around it and say, these are all the things about the human condition. And the same thing goes true with me and my heart and my psyche and how God created me is that I, I can't figure myself out. I, I, can't, I, I can't always rely on my investigative mind to figure everything out about life. And so when you're a pastor... And there's just so many things that you can't figure out. You realize you have to throw up your hands and you say, God, I just leave all this in your hands and you deal with it. And the, the thing is, is that that is when, when you finally in your life, like me, just say, I, I can't figure all this out, Lord. I just need to let you take charge and 
help me understand that I'm not perfect and I can't do everything and just put it all in your hands. And the amazing thing about God is that he does. And it took me a long time in my life just because of the way he created me for him to get me to the position where I realized the importance and the importance of prayer in my own life. And I'm ashamed to say that. And uh, so if you have a great prayer life, uh, kudos to you. And, and God, I'm sure, has blessed you immensely because of that. But it took a long time for me to understand the importance of prayer in my life. And so, but now that I, now that I understand the importance of prayer and the importance of, of spending that time, that face time, prosukamai, the, the, the Greek word for prayer, pros is, is facing, ukamai uh, is, is facing, um, is to, to, to speak. So in Greek, uh, pros ukamai is speaking towards God. It's, it's basically pouring out your, your heart towards God. That's what prayer is, is calling out to God, speaking to God, facing God, being in the presence of God. All of that stuff is, is uh, and uh, it's a it's a dependent it's a deponent. <laughs> Should I get into Greek on this? It's a passive word, which means prosukamai is not something necessarily that we do, but it's something that God does to us when we face Him and we call out to Him. Basically, that's that's basically what prayer is. Is a some it's this it's not something that we're doing, which is the which is the active form. It's not the passive form, which is God doing something to us. It's this, it's called the middle deponent form, which means that we're both doing something in this relationship of prayer. Prasukamai, omai is the Greek ending for middle deponent Greek. Oh, well, never mind. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> that's getting, that's getting really into the weeds, isn't it? But it's so important to understand because prayer is, is this mutual relationship between man and God. And it is very, very Powerful, and I'm not saying that it's powerful in that when you go to God in prayer and say, "God, I was just telling my wife this morning that I that my dream is to have a cyber truck." I don't know if you've seen a cyber truck, but it's this thing that Elon Musk is producing. It's a truck, all electric vehicle, and I think everybody will be driving them in 20 years. So I can probably get a used one pretty cheap in 20 years. But they're going to start delivering them at the end of the uh, at the end of this year. They're manufacturing them in Austin, Texas, and I would just love to have a Cybertruck. I'm not going to purchase a Cybertruck. I was just talking about it. Anyway, so um, I have no idea why I got into Cybertruck. Hmm. It was something about prayer, middle deponent. Oh, yeah, so you don't, you don't go to God and say, God, um, help me get a Cybertruck. That is not, and, and that if you have a really deep faith, and if you really love God, and if God really loves you, a cyber truck will, will show up on your doorstep. It just doesn't happen that way, all right? What does happen is that when you go to prayer in God, thy will be done, thy kingdom come, he shapes your heart so that the things that you pray for are in line with what his will is. And so therefore he does work in your life to do things in your life because they're what you are doing is you're aligning your will to him. That's kind of what James is talking about here, actually, as we read further. But it is so true. If you're in trouble, if you're suffering, if you've got anything in your life going on, I cannot stress this enough. Just simply go to God in prayer. Spend that time with the creator of the universe and there's all sorts of things you can do in prayer. One is you can pray for forgiveness for the times that you've failed in this world. You can, you can pray for strength and the Holy Spirit will come and give you wisdom and guidance and actually the forces of God's power, the, the Sabaoth, the, the armies of the Lord that are at the ready and willing to help you in your life, all of that stuff. He brings you into the kingdom. He gives you... Um, the, the honor of being in his kingdom because you're no longer a slave, but you are a son of the king, of the creator of the universe. All of that stuff is realized in prayer. So I cannot stress enough 
that if you are going through something in your life, any struggle whatsoever, first and foremost, have that deep relationship with the creator of the universe that you can go to him and pray and he will fill you with more of him and less of you and he will be a healing thing in your life and the troubles, they may not go away, but you will know that God is with you in the troubles. How's that? So if anyone is in trouble, pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. This is the other side of it. There are times in your life when you're just filled with joy for what God is doing in your life, for what things are going on in your life. You wake up one morning and there's a cyber truck sitting out on the driveway. <laughs> you're filled with joy. No, the, um, there are times, and the things that make Christians joyful and happy are totally different than what I think the world or the culture around us finds joyful and happy. We find joy and happy in things like forgiveness, grace, love, perfection. The things that emulate the, the character and the heart of God are, are the things that really make us happy as Christians. And when we're happy, what should we do? Sing songs of praise. Sing songs of praise. The, uh, the saleo is the, uh, the word to sing songs here, saleo. Um, which is, which is the same root as psalms. So basically, just sing songs of praise. And if you've ever read, I hope you have many, many times, the psalms, it's the psalter of the Bible. It's the songs. It, the great thing about the psalms, and I think I've said this before, the great thing about the psalms is it teaches us as humans how to interact with the creator of the universe. What our attitude and our position and our heart should be when we come to God in prayer, when we come in psalms, when we come in, in mourning or sadness or joy or happiness or all that. It's all covered in the psalms. And the psalms teach us. They're, they're, not, only, they're not only prayers from the heart that tell us you know, that we can pray to God, but they also form our heart and teach us how we should pray towards God. The psalms are great great, great source of that. Now, the Psalms aren't the only way we can praise towards God. We have, today, music is ubiquitous, and there's lots of good Christian music out there, and if you ever listen to it, it fills your heart with joy. Why? Because it's some creator or composer or whatever saying, this is how I relate to God. This is my heart towards God. And, and you will find a lot of the same themes in the Psalms that you do in, the, in even modern-day Christian music. As a matter of fact, I bet... If you listen to Caleb and listen to these songs, you probably would find every theme that's in the Psalms in these songs. So there's nothing wrong with listening to Christian music at all. I mean, it's, it fills our hearts with joy. And, and the great thing about modern day Christian music, it's just so easy to come up with a song and to pull together a sound or a thought or a process that really is somebody's heart towards God. And you can feel their emotion and feel their joy and feel their pain and feel all those things that we experience when we come into the face of God and we say, God, heal me from this. So if you're happy, sing your songs of praise. If you're, if you're in trouble, pray to God. Sing psalms of lamenting to prayer. Is any one of you sick? Now, this is, <laughs> this, this is also something that we should listen very carefully to. If any one of you is sick, call on the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well, and the Lord will raise them up. Now, this is very, very powerful. If you are sick, is anyone among you sick? Let him call the pastor. No, it doesn't say that. It says, let them call the elders of the church to pray over them, and to anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. Now, if you'll remember, in uh, Mark, Jesus sent out the 72. He didn't send out the disciples. He sent out 72, two by two. So that would be 36 pairs of men to go out into the villages and to prepare a way for Jesus. And how did they prepare for Jesus? They would go into a town. They would try to find people of it says in scripture, people of peace, but these are people who were receptive to, to these men coming into their house, into their village or whatever. And they would go door to door and they would say, is anybody sick here? 
And they'd say, yes, my, my brother's sick, my wife is sick, my child is sick. And they would go in and they would listen. And then they would anoint with oil and pray and put their hands over people. This is the main calling of the Christian church. And the older I get, the more I realize that this is probably the number one thing that the, that the Protestant church has kind of fallen away from that, that we should probably reactivate is to teach in our congregations the way of Jesus, which is basically to listen to people and to pray over people. Now, we do teach this in our congregation with a program called Stephen Ministry, where we, where we will pair up people and they'll go and they'll listen and they'll pray over people. And this is, this is directly, it's called Stephen Ministry because of Acts 6, where they had the, the, the deacons or these assistants that were helping out the disciples. But, but it's really, I think, more this that you've got people in your congregation that have that strong connection with God, their roots are deep. And they're not going to judge a person on their sickness because of something that they've done, but they're going to see the sickness for what it is. Is it's an it's a it's the manifestation of of sin in the world at some level, and they're suffering from a disease or a sickness because of sin, and they will listen patiently, and then they will place their hands on somebody or anoint with oil and pray over that person. Now, I as a pastor get to see this all the time. Because if somebody's in the hospital or somebody's sick or somebody's just grieving, I get the great joy and privilege in going and doing this with people. But it, it should not be solely the job of the pastor. This is the job of the church. And we should be training from early on, even little kids, to learn how to pray over somebody and to, to listen and to pray over somebody. This is, the, in my opinion, like the number one thing that we should be teaching our congregations and our people. And somehow, I bet a lot of congregations already do this. And somehow, for whatever reason, maybe because I never had a very deep prayer life, I never saw a need for this. And so I never got activated in this area. Who I don't know what it, what it was, but for me, I just never, ever really saw this as a great thing that the church could do but it is it's like the number one thing a church can do if anyone's sick you know we always think of sickness as as coronavirus right and that that if we go and somebody's sick with the coronavirus we place our hands and pray over them that you know they get well and so we know that that's that there's a whole side of medicine and all that sort of thing and you know you could pray over somebody and actually get the coronavirus yourself but you're taking a very medical, clinical view of what sickness is in the New Testament. Sickness in the New Testament is anything that harms your body, soul, or spirit that can separate you from God. So there's a whole bunch of things. I mean, even what it, it's what it says here, if you confess your sins to each other and pray for each other, in the, in the New Testament, the time of Jesus, sickness was just not a medical condition. It was a whole spiritual condition that had a whole spiritual aspect to it. And we even know this in the medical side, that one of the things that can protect you and give you immunity to some sicknesses is getting proper rest, not being in stress. Stress is probably the number one thing. A little bit of stress is good. It releases cortisol into your body. Here I am medical, right? It releases a little bit of cortisol in your body and helps your body fight. But too much stress in your body, too much stress in your body will debilitate you, will kill you, will shut down your whole immune system. So the things that will protect you from coronavirus are getting lots of vitamin D outside, de-stressing your life, taking long walks, being in the presence of God, having a strong prayer life. All of these things are very, very good for you to help protect you against actual medical diseases. And we've gone so far on the medical side that we've forgotten on the disease side that there's a another aspect to medicine, which is walking alongside somebody, praying for them, helping them get their strength up so that they can fight the disease, knowing that they're loved, knowing that God loves them, knowing that we love them, knowing that they are a child of God. And yes, if they've got some sort of unconfessed sin in their life, 
listen to that, right? We have in the Catholic Church, it's you go into confession in the in the uh, in the Protestant Church. Often there's a confession and absolution at the beginning or at the end of the worship service, or we do it with communion. Um, but there is a, there is a healing cleansingness that happens when you confess your sins, and we understand that. James understood this in leaps and bounds that the most wonderful thing that you can do as a follower of Jesus Christ is to build your own faith up, be a person of prayer who is in the presence of God and prays to God and has that relationship to God where every day he's filling you up with him and then going out into the world and filling other people up with him, listening to them, helping them work through the issues that they're going through in life, helping them with the struggles of life, praying over them, anointing them with oil, all of these things are what we can do as followers of Jesus Christ as the church. And somehow over the last probably 100 years, we've kind of lost. Maybe it's just because we know that there's a medical side to this and that, you know, well, we'll just send that person to the doctor and they'll get a vaccination or whatever. And we've forgotten that healing has a whole different side to it, which is a spiritual side, which is so powerful. And, and that... I can't tell you how many times I as a pastor have placed my hands on somebody and prayed for them when they're sick or when they're hurting or whatever. And that person that I have prayed for, they appreciate that so much. They feel the presence of God in their life so much. They feel that God is doing something in their life so much. And that should not be limited to the pastor. As a matter of fact, I think the definition of pastor, actually, if you look at the biblical definition of Ephesians 4.11, he gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, or pastors and teachers. I think every Christian is a, is a teacher. At every level, if Jesus is working in your life, you are a teacher. Everyone. If you've been baptized at some level, you're going to teach your faith to somebody else. So everyone's a teacher. The pastors... I think are the mature teachers that have struggled with life and they understand life at a deeper level and they are these shepherds or, or people that can pray over other people. So it's kind of a level up from just teaching people is really caring for people and shepherding people and being in their life and helping them. And if all of that is only done by the pastor, the Christian church will fall away because there aren't enough pastors to do that. But if every Christian aims to be shepherding or pastoral, right? Pastoral and shepherding is this is this uh, agricultural term or this animal term. If more people would act in their life like pastors, if more Christians can can be filled up with more of God and see this in James and be this, the elders of the church are basically pastors at this point, and, and we we don't even call pastors because there's so many different I'm going way late here. I'm sorry. I'll wrap it up here. We have we have in the Bible there's there's a whole bunch of different things that are in this role that we call the office of public ministry. So in our church, I am fulfilling a role called the office of public ministry, which is something that you've given me. You all call me pastor because I'm very loving and caring and compassionate supposedly. I don't know how loving, caring, com, you know, compassionate I am. But um you give me that role, you call me pastor. But many of you listening are probably better pastors, loving, compassionate, caring people than I am because you've lived your life. You see this at a broader sense and you're able to provide comfort to people. And I see you in our congregation as shepherds or pastors, just so you know. I might have this title called pastor, but the title really should be given to you. And the title should be given to anybody who cares for and loves other people in this world. That's um, so. And I see all of that here in James. And I see, I, I just, you know, maybe we'll, maybe we'll just close in prayer and we'll just finish this up. And then we've got the rest of James. And I think we're going to be finished tomorrow. But uh, let's go ahead and close in prayer. Gracious God, fill us more of you and less of me so that we can love the world and care for the world and pastor and shepherd the world around us. Because of your son, Jesus, in his name, amen. 
All right, so thank you for joining me today and God's richest blessings. I'm sorry I went long, but sometimes I do that. And hey, we will we'll talk tomorrow. Take care. Bye.